This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. We've had quite a lot of interesting updates at Boca Chica around the orbital launch preparations. We have grid fin mount points for the Super Heavy, loads of tower stacking, Starship 16 rolled away and may well be destined for the first ever hypersonic flight. We are diving right into all of that. We also have news on the space launch system. The three critical elements of the Artemis launch vehicle are now together inside the vehicle assembly building at Kennedy Space Center. SpaceX launched the the GPS-3 SV-5 mission, China launched three Taikonauts to their space station, Rocket Lab are going to Mars, yep you just heard that correctly. Then speaking of Mars, Ingenuity had its seventh flight and Perseverance rover begins its very first science campaign. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. We begin this week with news from the launch site in Boca Chica. Over the last few weeks, we've seen rapid progress with the launch pad itself, which will support the vehicle during its flight campaign. The launch table itself that is currently residing at the build site will eventually be moved to the orbital launch pad and placed on top of the white-legged structure that we can see here. Not a lot of updates on that, but we have seen hydraulics going in, so work is continuing. Here is the massive integration tower which will be used to stack the Starship vehicle on top of the Super Heavy. That we believe is going to stand around 144 meters in height. Eventually this tower will also be used to catch the returning booster as well and we've been watching the construction closely to see hints on how this may occur. The fourth section of this orbital launch tower was lifted on Sunday last weekend and was stacked late in the afternoon. On Wednesday the fifth tower section was stacked and on Friday morning the sixth sixth tower section was rolled over to the launch site. Additionally, thanks to RGV Aerial Photography, make sure you're supporting there, he captured photos of the various parts for section 7 of the integration tower, which were then assembled soon after his flyover. That should leave, I think, just one more, eight in total. While all this stacking has been occurring, Brendan Lewis has been showcasing this great infographic, which has been keeping us up to date with the status of the launch tower itself. That has been very handy for everybody following here so closely. Now beside the orbital launch tower we have the orbital tank farm which is made up of three cryogenic liquid oxygen tanks, three liquid methane tanks, a single liquid nitrogen tank and then a non-cryogenic water tank. This week one of these cryo tank shells which will help insulate the cryo tanks underneath was lifted over to the orbital tank farm for a presumed test fit. Eventually it will be permanently placed over one of these GSE tanks. Now the stacking of a third cryo shell began last weekend as well and there's also a large 12 meter water tank here that is built with the same process of the cryo shells. That water tank was rolled to the tank farm last week and it's already in position right here. The difference of course being that this will contain a much larger volume of water given the extra diameter. The test tank known as BN 2.1 had another run this week as well. The test seemed to proceed through its various stages uneventfully so that is a good sign. Now back over here near the launch tower a new foundation for an unknown structure is in progress. We've got no idea what this is for but if you have any thoughts let me know. We're going to be keeping a close eye on that. All the way over at the build site, Booster 2, or whatever we're deciding to call it these days, has had quite the week and we've had a nice set of updates here to share. Booster 2 was lifted to the front of the high bay to stack the liquid oxygen tank onto the thrust section. Once the liquid oxygen tank is stacked on top, it completes the lower section of the booster with the next step of stacking the methane tank. These two sections will then be mated together to complete the entire booster. Now we have here the forward dome sleeve, which is the section that sits right on top of the booster stack that was flipped as well. Now just take a look at this. These holes that we see here are the mounting points for the four grid fins. If you look closely enough the arrangement is not the same as what we've always expected. This is SpaceX's Falcon 9. The grid fins are placed equally around the vehicle 90 degrees apart. Whenever we've witnessed the Falcon 9 come back to land we see this very clearly. 
Now we've always just assumed the Super Heavy booster would be similar, but it isn't. These holes are not equally spaced by 90 degrees. Instead, the two grid fins on each side spread 60 degrees apart, with there being a 120 degree space between the two sides. Now I am assuming here that the main reason for this is to provide more space for the booster to come in to be caught without the grid fins being in the way of the tower. Massive thank you there to Jack Bayer with NASA Spaceflight out there capturing all of these images. Make sure you're following Jack on Twitter there too, as he is always dropping interesting images like this. That is a significant find right there. On Monday the 14th of June, these two pieces were added right here. Now many have been thinking that this is part of a system used for catching the booster out of the air. That is a total guess at this point, but I'm thinking that we may see some significant reinforced parts be added in this area if that is the case. Remember back in April, Elon Musk specifically tweeted that the load points will be just below the grid fins. This point here is indeed just below. I've had a number of comments suggesting that this can't be true as there would need to be some kind of shock absorption system built into this. Remember though that this shock absorption system will not actually be built on the booster itself, but instead it will be built into the tower arms. It makes sense for the booster to be as simple as possible and then SpaceX can build that complexity into the launch tower itself. Also in this area, Starship number 16 has been rolled out of the high bay on Wednesday and taken up to sit close by Starship 15. Soon after, Elon announced on Twitter that they might actually use Starship number 16 on a hypersonic flight test. He didn't indicate whether or not this could happen before SN20's orbital flight, so the timeline on this is unknown. Having a Starship fly fast enough to exceed that barrier, which is typically anything between Mark 5 and Mark 10, or a minimum of around 6,200 kilometers per hour will certainly be a first. That is faster, by the way, than a Falcon 9 re-entering the atmosphere after its entry burn. Now, I'm assuming that they would still attempt to bring this back to land on the landing pad, but perhaps they could choose to fly much further out and ditch it in the ocean. What do you think? So we also had two Raptor engines delivered to Starbase last weekend on Saturday morning. These were Raptor number 72 with the label Velociraptor, as well as Raptor 74 called Plaid Mode, obviously inspired by Tesla's launch of the Plaid Mode Model S last week. Now in other news, SpaceX recently closed on the purchase of Macy's gun shop and range on the way to Starbase. Sources close to this deal have indicated that this location will be the Raptor facility and possible uses may include repair, rebuild and testing of rocket engines. Now speaking of Raptor engines, an interesting graphic got a lot of attention when SpaceX's COO Gwen Shotwell shared some footage while she was doing her commencement address with Northwestern University. We can see her here strolling down the SpaceX factory in Hawthorne, California, and if you look closely at this point in the speech, you can see here a screen that says Starship Orbital Launch. A number of people out there of course have created a version of this to show it a little clearer. Firstly here we see Countdown which reads 25 days, 7 hours and 30 minutes. Many have been assuming that this is a timeline for the launch of Booster 2 and Starship 20, but keep in mind that this video was pre-recorded when July 1st was the goal for the first orbital flight. Plans now have obviously changed because with the massive amount of work to be done, that goal is now impossible. The board also shows which Raptors have or haven't been shipped to Starbase. It shows in green that the center cluster of Super Heavy engines and two Raptors for Starship have already been shipped, and of course this is out of date. How crazy is that? So yes, quite a lot going on there around Starship development. Progress is super quick. It is just so thrilling to watch each and every week. And thank you all so much for subscribing here to stay up to date. I launch these videos at the same time every Saturday, and that is all because of your support right there. Just liking and sharing makes such a difference to what I do. Thank you very much. Now this week gave us the best live drone ship landing footage that I think I've ever seen. I do realize I've said that a few times now, but hey, they keep on getting better. Just check this out. This launch was for the GPS-3 SV-5 mission for the United States Space Force, and the launch itself was just lit up beautifully with incredible weather. Once again, Greg Scott out there capturing these shots in glorious detail. We see here this beautiful view from the Falcon 9 there on the ascent. This was the 
the 19th Falcon 9 launch this year and was also the first time a booster has been reused by the US Space Force. This same booster was flown once before on the previous GPS-3 SV-4 mission. We had the typical engine cutoff and stage separation, then all eyes were on the booster. The footage here just mesmerizing. I don't know about you, this still blows my mind each and every time. There we go, beautiful clear footage right down to just read the instructions, which is of course the name of this drone ship. Now even the camera signal on the ship itself was flawless. They are really improving that signal big time and I'm going to assume that Starlink has something to do with that. There we have the payload deployment shot and yes another terrific mission from SpaceX that never gets old. Now we have some space launch system news. For the first time, the three critical elements of the Artemis launch vehicle are now together inside the vehicle assembly building at Kennedy Space Center. Over the course of two days, a heavy lift crane carried out a methodical slow choreographed transfer of the core stage from the transfer aisle over to the mobile launcher. This massive stage weighs in at over 85 metric tons and it stands around 65 meters tall. The core stage was lowered in between the two 54 meter solid rocket boosters in High Bay 3. The Artemis 1 uncrewed Orion capsule test flight will be the first to return towards the moon since Apollo 17 in 1972. Of course, the goal for the capsule is to travel out beyond the moon before returning to Earth with the mission lasting three weeks. So what comes next is that the launch vehicle stage adapter which connects the core stage with the upper stage will go on top. This will then be followed by the interim cryogenic propulsion system and then the umbilicals which will be connected and powered up. The Orion stage adapter will then be stacked and a mass simulator will be placed on top. That will sit in place of the European service module, Orion crew module and launch abort system also known as the Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle. Now, the first mission with crew for the new Chinese space station launched this week as well. This was a Long March 2F vehicle, and on board for this mission was three Taikonauts. This is actually the first crewed flight from China in about five years. They have already boarded the station soon after docking on Thursday, and they'll be spending three months on board here before returning home. We are going to be seeing a lot more activity in the near future as well, because this is only the third of 11 launches involved in building out the space station. That should be completed sometime in 2022. On a Tuesday, some eagle-eyed Twitter users noticed that Rocket Lab had filed a trademark request for a new engine called Archimedes. This is very exciting to see because it's most likely the name of the four first stage engines for the upcoming Neutron rocket. That is of course Rocket Lab's new partially reusable medium lift launch vehicle design. Interestingly, on the same day, Rocket Lab announced that it had been awarded a contract to send two photon spacecraft to Mars. Now, these are going to be used in NASA's upcoming Escapade mission. This mission is going to involve having two spacecraft orbiting Mars to study the structure, composition, variability, and structure of the Martian magnetosphere. More specifically, how solar winds have stripped it away over time. This is essential information for humanity to understand before any distant future terraform forming systems could be used successfully. Many people have in the past discussed a variety of ways to terraform Mars, but we'll need a much better understanding of such a process well before any such plan could be established. So the two photon spacecraft named Blue and Gold will be launched in 2024 on board a NASA provided rideshare launch vehicle. They will then begin an 11 month interplanetary coast before arriving at Mars to begin their year long mission. Escapade aims to demonstrate a cost effective interplanetary mission with Rocket Lab's CEO Peter Beck saying that they want to deliver big science in a small package. Now, while we are over here at Mars, the helicopter Ingenuity's recent seventh flight speaks volumes of the robust design of this heroic little rotor craft. After Flight 6 had the issues during the second leg of the trip, it still managed to power its way along, staying aloft before making a safe landing near its intended landing site. This time around, though, no such issues at all, with Ingenuity flying for just over one minute and covering a distance of 106 meters or 348 feet in a southerly direction direction, touching down in airfield number four. After all of these successful flights, the Mars rover Perseverance is now focused on science tasks as opposed to observing the flights of this history-making helicopter. 
Speaking of the helicopter ingenuity, there is a terrific documentary about the future of such drones right here. And thank you very much to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring today's video. Curiosity Stream, of course, is an incredible subscription streaming service that I've been subscribed to myself for years. The content here is exactly the stuff that inspires me to follow what I do here on the channel. Drones have already provided incredible value on Earth. The Mars helicopter is proving to be extremely successful so far, and that is with the incredible challenge of flying in the minuscule atmospheric density that exists on the Red Planet. Research in these drones doesn't stop here though. All of this paves the way for an even more exciting future. This episode of Breakthrough talks about Dragonfly, which is a future daring mission to Saturn's largest moon Titan that aims to find prebiotic chemical processes that are common both there and here on Earth. That is set to launch in 2026 and will be the first time that NASA will fly a multi-rotor vehicle on another planet or moon. There are so many questions and answers that are explored right here on Curiosity Stream. This wonderful streaming service provides thousands of award-winning documentaries, including this huge library of space-related content. You could be interested in other science and technology-related topics as well. It could be medicine, genetics, physics, or biology. There are many great libraries here for you to explore, and you can even stream this awesome content worldwide anytime on a range of supported devices. If you would like to help support me and would like to check it out, give it a try by heading to curiositystream.com slash Marcus House. With that, you can sign up for access at just $14.99 for the entire year. You'll find that link in the description below. So along with Ingenuity updates, we have a few quick things to catch up with in regard to the Mars Perseverance rover. That has essentially now completed all of its system tests. The automatic navigation and sampling systems are not fully online as yet, but they will be once Perseverance reaches its first site of interest. Southwest of the Octavia E. Butler landing site is a low-lying area that overlooks Jezero Crater. It is here that the rover will collect a sample or two from four sites of interest in what is thought to be an ancient area once covered by at least 100 metres of water. When the science team are satisfied to hit the road again, Perseverance will head back to the landing site before heading north and then west to the fan-shaped delta region. This zone of a once-merging river and lake could possibly be carbonate mineral rich and contain signs of fossilized ancient life. The green area that you can see here could possibly be the ancient shoreline of Lake Jezero. I can't wait to see what they discover here. Could they perhaps find signs of past biological activity? I'm interested to know what you think. Now, if you're wondering why we haven't seen any more Starlink launches yet, that is because the initial shell is complete. The next launch will actually be starting off a set of polar missions, with the first to be launched sometime in July. A quick special mention as well for the NROL 111 flight from Wallops, because it isn't every day you get to see a giant banana unzip at launch. Also, I just had to show this image here shared by NASA last week. I'd missed it at the time, but this here is an image of Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, which was taken by the Juno Cam imager during Juno's flyby on June the 7th. It flew closer to Jupiter's largest moon here than any other vessel in more than two decades. Each pixel of this image represents around one kilometer. It is just mind blowing. So yes, remember as well that we are huge supporters of the transition to electric vehicles here on the channel, and our partner EV offers the ability to hire an electric vehicle in Australia. Perhaps you have wanted to take an extended test drive. You could be touring the country and want to drive around in a Tesla. If that sounds appealing to you, you can use the link in the description for a discount. Thank you very much for watching all the way through here. Just providing that constant watch time helps more than you would think. This is just one way that you can help get the word out about the channel that I run here. You could be a regular viewer of my content, perhaps a patron or YouTube member supporting what we do, or you could also be picking up some gear from our merch store, including this shirt that I'm wearing today. You can pick that up on a mug, shirt, hoodie, and a bunch of other cool stuff. No matter how you support, know that it does make a big impact on what I can do here with the channel, and allows me to increase the time that the team and I can collectively spend in research, editing, and that quality control. If you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to help assist 
assist me with what I do directly, you can join as a YouTube member via the join button below, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Marcus House. Either of those options gives you access to chat with us more directly via the link trolls on our Discord server. You can also have your name listed right here like all these other amazing people, and you also get earlier and ad-free access to the videos to watch before anyone else. Thanks to the production crew and the quality control squad here for the amazing assistance each week. If you are interested in these topics as well and you would like to keep up to date, remember to subscribe here below and follow me on Twitter at Marcus House. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week. In the top right is my latest video. And in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from the channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.